order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls, a war on terror, a war on drugs, a war on kindness, a war on hugs, a war on birds, and a war on bees. They got a war on hippies trying to save the trees. Hi, I'm Liz Reese, and welcome to Voices of Resistance. Now, this episode is entitled Refuse Fascism, November 4th, It Begins. And part of this episode, you're going to be seeing some of the awesome march that happened here in Honolulu on November 4th, as well as a rally that we had over at Thomas Square. But before I get into November 4th and what that was all about, on a personal note, I want to let people know that this will be the last episode of Voices of Resistance for quite a while. I have been doing this monthly series, which has been appearing weekly for over 10 years now. I had to stop and think, when did I start doing Voices of Resistance? And I actually first started when George W. Bush was the president. And I was active with the group World Can't Wait and still am with World Can't Wait. And, you know, wanted to do the show to really expose the crimes being committed by our government at that time under George W. Bush. And believe me, the list goes on and on of the horrendous crimes being committed by the U.S. government under George W. Bush. Just to name a few, illegal war, torture, mass incarceration, the list goes on and on. Then, of course, after George W. Bush, we had eight years of Obama. And while Obama appeared much more liberal and was even known as the so-called anti-war president, it was important to keep exposing the crimes that were continued under the Obama administration, um, the same crimes being committed under Bush, like torture at Guantanamo, which was one of Obama's first promises before he came, became president, was he promised to shut down and close Guantanamo and stop the torture. Yet here we are, Guantanamo is still open, torture still continues. Also wanted to expose a lot of the war crimes being committed under Obama, such as um, killing civilians and innocent people with drones, which still goes on. Now here we are under so-called President Trump, and the list of crimes continues and goes on. And it's even more important to expose what the agenda of the Trump-Pence regime is. And that is a fascist agenda. So I have been working with the group Refuse Fascism, which I've done many shows on, and really trying to expose the whole fascist agenda of the Trump-Pence regime um, and what this entails. And I want to briefly read one of the statements from Refuse Fascism, which I think is really good in explaining why this nightmare must end and why the Trump-Pence regime must go. This nightmare must end. A nightmare. Immigrants living in terror. Their next step could mean detention, deportation, being torn from children and loved ones. A nightmare. Muslims and refugees demonized, banned, and cast out. A nightmare. Millions, children, the elderly, disabled, the sick, the poor, denied health care, food assistance, the very right to live. A nightmare. Women objectified, degraded, and denied the basic right to control their own reproduction with fundamentalist Christian fascism increasingly being made law. A nightmare. LGBTQ people stigmatized, ostracized, and denied civil rights recently won. A nightmare. Black and Latino people openly threatened by the president with maximum sentencing, stop and frisk going national, intensified police brutality, and murder of our youth with no holds barred. A nightmare. People all over the world facing bombings, occupations, war, and the threat of nuclear war with Donald Trump's America first finger on the nuclear trigger. A nightmare. The truth bludgeoned, lies and more lies, critical thinking being destroyed in education and public discourse. A nightmare. The whole planet in peril, 
from a regime that denies global warming and shreds all environmental protections. A nightmare, a regime step by step discarding basic democratic rights, targeting group after group and suppressing dissent and resistance, a regime unleashing the violence of white supremacists, anti-Semites, and fascist thugs. This is fascism, a qualitative change in how society is governed. History has shown that fascism must be stopped before it becomes too late. This nightmare must end. Millions feel this and ache with the question of how to stop this unrelenting horror. The stakes are nothing less than the future of humanity and the planet itself. Who will end this nightmare? We will. Only the determined struggle of millions of people acting together with courage and conviction can drive this regime from power. So that was the statement laid out from Refuse Fascism, and that was where we were going into in planning November 4th. So just to let people know, on November 4th, over 4,000 people participated in actions in different cities across the country. At the end of the show, you'll see a short clip showing some of the big demonstrations happening in different cities, such as Los Angeles, Seattle, Cleveland, New York City. And if people want more information, they can go to refusefascism.org which has lots of information, news, and about the events that happened on November 4th. So I just wanna give a little background on November 4th here in Honolulu. We started the day off with a march that started um, over at Ala Moana Park, kind of over in the Piikoi Ala Moana Boulevard area. And we marched from there over to Thomas Square. Around 250 people participated in the march from Ala Moana to Thomas Square. And I wanna give a big thank you and shout out to Doug Matsuoka, who both filmed the march and live streamed it at the event. And you'll be seeing some of the footage from that march that he took. And then we had a really awesome rally at Thomas Square. Unfortunately, um, I don't have footage of all the speakers at the rally, and it was quite a long rally, a couple of hours. But um, there was a lot of really good speakers and poets, and you're gonna see a few of them. I just wanna quickly wanna read the list of endorsers of this march that happened on November 4th for the march and rally, because to me, it gives a good idea of the variety in the different groups. And you know, if people aren't aware of some of these groups here in Hawaii that are organizing in grassroots organizations, that are you know, fighting and resisting together, I think it gives a really good view of the diversity in the different organizations that work together on November 4th. So this is the list of the endorsers of the March and Rally. 350.org Hawaii, 808 RAN, Affirm, Aloha Immigration, Amnesty International Hawaii, Campus Anti-Fascist Network, Deoccupy Honolulu, Hawaii Institute for Human Rights, Hawaii J20, the Hawaii Coalition for Justice in Palestine, the Hawaii Okinawa Alliance, Hawaii Seed, Healthcare for All Hawaii, LGBT Caucus of the Democratic Party, Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific, Ohana Koa, Our Revolution Hawaii, the Progressive Movement of Hawaii, Rainbow Family 808, Sierra Club Hawaii, Veterans for Peace Chapter 113, Women's March Oahu, and World Can't Wait Hawaii, and Young Progressive Democrats Demanding Action, YPDA. So that's a you know, quite a long list of different organizations that endorsed the event on November 4th. And, um, you know, we were very happy that these groups came together in solidarity and brought different signs and banners, which you'll see in the march, you know, everything from talking about um, illegal occupation of the U.S. and Hawaii to, you know, climate change and the environment to women's rights the attacks on immigrants, Muslims, I think you know it's a really good breadth of the different kinds of people from younger folks to older folks. Um, we even had a trolley 
that was there for people who weren't um, physically able to do the march but wanted to participate. People could be on the trolley and ride over to Thomas Square. Now, for some of the footage that you're going to see at Thomas Square, like I said, there was some really awesome speakers and poets, and you're going to get a chance to see some of those. Um, you're going to get a chance to see um, Dr. Kalama Niheu, um, who's a Hawaiian activist and has been to Standing Rock, medical doctor, active with the Hawaiian independence movement, and groups such as Ohana Koa, Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific. Um, also, Anne Wright who I want to give a special shout out to. Um, Anne Wright, as many folks probably know, is a former U.S. Army colonel. Um, she was a colonel, I believe, for about uh, 30 years in the U.S. Army. And then she became um, State Department. And in 2003, she resigned her position in the U.S. State Department in opposition to the Iraq War. And since then, she has been you know, speaking out um, against U.S. war and war crimes, a peace activist, and she has been literally traveling around the world. Um, she's been active on Palestinian rights and has been on several of the flotillas to Gaza and demanding justice for pal Palestinians and to end the blockade. And I am very proud to say she has been my most frequent guest on Voices of Resistance. So I'm very happy that the last official episode of Voices of Resistance will show footage of Anne Wright speaking at the November 4th rally. Now, um, I just want to mention briefly, um, not give too much time to these assholes, but I want to mention briefly um, about a group called the Proud Boys. You know, part of all this stuff coming with Trump along with the attacks on truth because for a lot of people, you know, there is no truth. Even when you turn on, um, you know, the so-called fake news, Trump likes to, you know, call anything that attacks and exposes the truth around what his agenda is, is fake news. When the reality is that you have all these alt-right groups and Fox News and other kinds of internet groups and right-wing groups um, putting out really horrible, atrocious fake news. So there's this real quest for truth. And I'm all for speaking the truth and people need to find out what's true and what's reality. And a lot of these alt-right groups, you know, are always bashing and trying to confuse what the truth really is. And part of organizing for November 4th, both here locally as well as nationally, was all these, you know, internet trolls and right-wing groups attacking people, attacking activists, organizing for November 4th, putting out a lot of lies and BS that November 4th was going to be some type of, you know, violent um, overthrow of the government called by Antifa and all kinds of bogus BS to try and scare people into not participating and spread lies about the nature, which was November 4th was a nonviolent day of action and resistance. And the plan was to begin on November 4th and not stop and continue until the Trump-Pence regime is actually driven out of power, which is what we need to do for humanity and the planet. Anything else is unacceptable. So back to the Proud Boys. There is a national group called the Proud Boys. Um, you know, they're very, it's all male, pro-Trump group. Um, they, one of their lines is, the West is the best. Um, you know, basically they're just another horrible, racist, sexist group out there spreading a lot of lies and BS. And here in Hawaii, they like to go to different events. They've been at events that we had as well as the November 3rd event at the state capitol, um, which many people were at opposing Trump when he was here visiting Hawaii. And, you know, sometimes they like to wear their Proud Boy shirts and wave their flags. And oftentimes they like to be kind of discreet and go around and film people and interview people and not really say who they are or what their purpose is. And then they'll put this kind of, you know, stuff on social media and edit and splice different people of what they're saying and use it to basically, you know, spread lies and confusion about what the movement is about. So you also see a little bit of footage of that as well. But I hope it gives people a good idea of what happened both here locally 
on November 4th. And like I said, you'll see a little bit of November 3rd, which was several hundred people over at the state capitol with a really good spirit and attitude and a different mix of people. Um, and that led right up to November 4th march and rally. Now, I did say that this was my last official episode of Voices of Resistance. I do not w want people to be confused because the resistance must and will continue. And hopefully I will be back in the studio to do some different specials on, you know, different issues that are happening because, you know, there is so much work to do. And I will be just as busy continuing the resistance. And I hope people who have enjoyed Voices of Resistance will continue to um, follow some of the national groups such as World Can't Wait. And like I said, we have a local chapter, World Can't Wait Hawaii, as well as Refuse Fascism. So I encourage people to go to both of those websites, get more information. If you wanna hook up with us here locally, um, there is so much work to do and we need organizers and we need to be out in the streets and we have regular meetings where we're both trying to sum up and follow up the attacks that are happening from the stuff, for example, in North Korea, where we're actually talking about here in Hawaii, how to prepare for nuclear war. We are even having board meetings talking about, you know, what should we do when the sirens sound? And we now have a special monthly siren about the nuclear war attack. Well, let me tell you, the best way to prepare for nuclear war is not to have one. So anyone out there concerned about how to prepare for nuclear war, get off your butt and become an anti-war activist because this is absolute insanity that we sit here and go to meetings and talk about where to hide behind the car, should you go inside or outside, what about the nuclear fallout? You know, we have a president who is openly threatening a whole group of people in North Korea with nuclear war. So people gotta be out there opposing any kind of war, especially nuclear war. And the list goes on and on. But what I hope people have gotten from Voices of Resistance and one of my main goals is to both expose the crimes being committed by our government and now with Trump to expose how and why this is a fascist agenda that must be exposed and we must be resisting against it. And also to show examples of all different kinds of people, both here in Hawaii, both across the US and around the world. Courageous people who on a regular basis stand up and resist. And they do it for humanity and they do it for the planet. And that's what always inspires me. And I also need to give a very, you know, serious shout out to all the people who have helped me to do Voices of Resistance and have helped to make it possible. And I wanna start with a big heartfelt thank you to Oren who is the tech person who always helps me with all the footage and all the sound and all the whatnots that I don't understand and drives me crazy. And it wouldn't be possible to do this show without him. So thank you very much. And I also want to give a shout out to the, all the very hardworking staff at Olelo. Um, I do this show currently at the Kaimuki studio. So I want to give a big thank you to Darren, Ann, and Keikoa with the Kaimuki, Kaimuki studio. Um, and I encourage people to take advantage of the services that Olelo has because we need a lot more, you know, voices of resistance and shows speaking about the truth um, on Olelo. So I encourage people out there who are like-minded and want a better world and stand up against all the horrible stuff that's happening, you know, look into doing a show on Olelo. And once again, thank you to all the people out there who sometimes watch Voices of Resistance, and who, like me, hate this nightmare that we are living in right now, and know that we have got to get rid of Trump and Pence before we can even start to address any of the other issues. So, be one of the Voices of Resistance, and stand up, because in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. And on that note, I want to thank you for watching Voices of Resistance. And I will be back. Thank you. 
Aloha, we are here at the uh, Alamoana Park, uh, right across uh, from P. Koi Street, the P. Koi Footbridge. It's the beginning of the uh, November 4th march against uh, Donald Trump's fascist regime. We're going to march from Alamoana Park up to Thomas Square. So I'm here at the beginning with Lizzie. Drive out the Trump fans regime! Coming over the bridge here. I like crossing the bridge, you know, see, so. There we go. Thank you. Great science here. A number of groups. Here's one of them. Men and women. Live this whole time after everybody crosses over the bridge. I'll uh, follow. Um, Great signs here. I think A Chan made these signs. Funnest gig is the uh, the drum hitting the drum thing. Hey, Dave Monix, right? <laughs> I like Good to see you. <laughs> the end coming up here. We're gonna go across the street here. We're marching in the streets here. Everybody uh, march through our POV here. We're coming straight up uh, decoy. Medicare for all, bringing up the rear. Many viewpoints uh, in this march, but all in unity. Dump Trump. Hey, Trump has got to go. Thank you. Here is the very end here. Fuck Trump. That's unambiguous. <laughs> I love that sign. <laughs> there we go. The Kenyan guys. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're gonna keep doing this. Let's go up, uh, march through the march, and.
still on T4. I think we're going to go up to uh, Barrett Canyon Street, take a left, and uh, head toward uh, Thomas Square. Complete distance in Thomas Square from Ala Moana is 1.2 miles, according to Google Maps. in front uh, going the pecan shell, the pool, and at the front the Hawaiian flag being flown upside down as a symbol of the nation in distress, the Hawaiian nation. I'm going to be a little careful here so I don't get run over, it should really be a shame. Let me push it in front here. So as I was saying, we see all kinds of people here, not only political groups united against Trump, but all kinds of people. We see uh, even the police are in unity against Trump. Nah. Flag up front. The Hawaiian nation. A lot of uh, water protectors, uh, Mauna protectors, the Lahaina, uh, Medicare for all, uh, climate change activists, uh, social activists, the firm feminists, uh, and the anti beauty queen. And uh, just plain pissed off there. We're working uh, up toward uh, Thomas Square, the first public park dedicated uh, in the 1840s by Kamehameha III, Kawikeauli, dedicated to the people in commemoration of the 1843 return of sovereignty by the British. British uh, misadventure by a uh, British citizen, Paulette, uh, for a short time until uh, the country was, the nationhood was restored on July 34, 31st, July 31st, 1843 by Admiral Thomas, and that's where Thomas Square gets its name. We start by the British Crown, and the Street Baritania, named after Britain. been some attempts to transfer Thomas Square to the Department of Enterprise Services to create a commercial area that has been resisted so far by the public. Honolulu, very near uh, McKinley High School, which was formerly known as Honolulu High School, and there's a story about McKinley High School too. There's a statue uh, of McKinley holding what they claim is a treaty of annexation. No such thing. There is not a treaty of annexation between Hawaii 
and the United States. A treaty of annexation has to be signed by both nations. There isn't one. So many people regard Hawaii as an independent nation yet. Feminists. No treaty for fake state. I saw that. That's absolutely true. People call it a state. After annexation 1897, it was annexed as a territory then and it was uh, declared a state in 1959. There was never any choice to remain an independent nation. Now President Trump was here last night. I don't know if he's departed yet. Is it? <laughs> businesses here. There's a hairdressing salon. People are like, oh, what's going on? That might be my favorite sign. Basically for a Hawaii march, people are marching too fast. <laughs> They're supposed to march slow, but I guess you get pumped up with the adrenaline and you start like marching fast. It's supposed to be slow, you know. The infamously misnamed or ill-named McKinley High School, formerly known as Honolulu High, Honolulu High School. There's kind of a movement to uh, rename it, and I'm all for that. Hey, there's Ernie. Candidate for governor. Huh? Candidate for governor live. How you doing? This is my logo now? Yeah, yeah, it's good, man. I like it. Good one. Okay, the corner hey, the right doing? across the street is Thomas Square. You can see this section's still walled off. Um, a lot of police, these guys in the Aloha shirts and Kevlar are police. You know, nobody wants to be in Hawaii and see a sea of uh, uniforms. So, put them in Aloha shirts, you know what I mean? Yeah, tag. Street here to the uh, open public section. This section is still walled because it's being uh, it's facing the uh, Blaze Out Center, so they're gonna tourist it up a little bit, make it fancy. So at least part of the uh, park will look like uh, a tourist kind of thing that the mayor wanted. The rest of us want Thomas Square to remain a public park. No commercial activity. No limits on free speech. 
place where uh, families can uh, hang out. I'm gonna turn around, we can see where we're going. This is the Victoria Street side of historic Thomas Square, dedicated to the people by Kamehameha III, King uh, Kamehameha III, Kawikeauli. In 1843, and right here, let's get Anne's sign. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you. you. <laughs> Didn't have the energy to walk all day. <laughs> you know, that's uh, Anne Wright. We're right under the banyan here. <laughs> there is a band stand here. Let's get on stage. Here at Thomas Square under the banyans, recently reopened. The mayor wanted to uh, transfer it into the uh, revenue generating uh, portion of the uh, city. The uh, public objected, passed an ordinance forbidding it. Then the mayor got around that by not transferring it, but transferring some of the duties. So this place is being uh, monitored and um, patrolled, that's the word, by uh, Department of Enterprise Services. Uh, security, private security, and they're rousting uh, people that look poor, that look like they might need a place to sleep, have a stage built up there, pretty good job. Every great struggle everywhere has demanded courage and has often demanded sacrifice, but we cannot shrink from that. We will not be provoked into foolish and alienating actions, nor will we be cowed by the slander and vilification this regime wallows in or attempts to divide us against each other. There is too much at stake. We remember the words of Pastor Martin Niemöller, the German clergyman who ended up in Hitler's concentration camps. Niemöller's famous quote is, first they came for the communists, but I was not a communist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the trade unionist, but I was not a trade unionist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the Jews, but I was not a Jew, so I said nothing. Then they came for me, and there was nobody left to speak. Niemöller also said, that had they stood up to Hitler at the very beginning, at a time when the direction and logic of the Nazis was clear, but the carnage had not yet fully begun, that even though there would have been tremendous sacrifice, it would have been worth it. It might have worked, he said, and think of what we would have avoided if we had. We surely face a situation no less grave. We honor the memory of those 
who stood against the Nazis, and all of those who stood for justice throughout history against heavy odds. We do not seek unnecessary sacrifice. On the contrary, we will do everything we can to prevent anyone in this movement from coming to harm, to protect each other. But we know that sacrifices are necessary in any great cause against entrenched power. And we know this, that we are not acting in isolation, but together with many others who recognize this great danger and are part of this great fight, and that we represent the interests of humanity as a whole. The people and the planet are depending on us. This nightmare must end. There is a way to do this, beginning here and beginning now, and beginning with each of you to make a crucial beginning in these next two weeks, and then go on from there. So join me in pledging and repeat after me, in the name of humanity. We refuse to accept a fascist America. The Trump-Pence regime must go. community leaders in the audience and uh, just really warms my heart thank you so much for being here it's these kinds of moments where we lock arms with our brothers and sisters in the movement for social justice and peace and sustainability uh, where I really find the hope necessary to keep going so I just take a moment right now to applaud all of your efforts all of you are working so hard and I'm so great to be counted among you I feel like we are the signal of hope that our children and our elders need during this very frightening and turbulent time. And I hope that you take strength from knowing that there are so many of us fighting on all fronts to ensure justice and peace and well-being for everyone. I hope that we can count on each other's support as we work hard to create a better world that we all need. A safe home for everyone. A quality public education for everyone. Adequate health care living wages, dignity, respect, sovereignty, and of course, a clean and healthy environment for all of us to thrive on. We cannot accept the increasing racial violence, the extreme economic uncertainty, and the widespread climate chaos. The fate of our people and our planet requires our unwavering determination to counter the politics of hate and destruction with a positive, equitable, an inclusive society that respects everyone's first mother. To get there, we must work together. We struggle together, and we have to build bridges across our differences together, because we're only going to get there together. For Sierra Club's part, we're directly engaged in kicking out the fossil fuel companies. We're working hard to ensure a just transition to clean energy for everyone in Hawaii and across the world. Fossil fuels threaten every aspect of our way of life, uh, from our economy to our environment, everything. Um, and I want to make sure that you know that on Oahu in particular, we're on the verge of a Flint, Michigan-like moment. More than 200,000 gallons of fuel have leaked from 20 military fuel tanks beneath Red Hill. And those tanks have been there for 70 years, 100 feet above our groundwater the primary groundwater aquifer for Oahu. 
the water we drink from that fountain. And none of that fuel has been cleaned up. And monitoring wells are now starting to detect contaminants in the groundwater. The groundwater is safe to drink right now, but there's no guarantee for the future. And the risk of these fuel tanks is far too extreme for us to accept. It's millions of gallons of fuel just resting in 70-year-old aging, leaky tanks 100 feet above the aquifer. So that is why the Sierra Club is demanding that the U.S. Navy fix up the tanks and guarantee they don't leak or shut them down and move out. The thing is, is that we need your help to hold the U.S. Navy accountable. There's no way just the Sierra Club by itself is going to be able to push back against such an, um, uh, an amazingly powerful entity. Um, but it is possible. Like, look at this moment that we've created here today the moment yesterday, and every opportunity we've had to speak out since the Trump administration came to power. And if we can cultivate alliances sprouted by these kinds of events, then we can emerge from the darkness with an incredibly, uh, you know, this is an incredibly important opportunity. We can make significant lasting changes here in Hawaii and across the Pacific. This is our moment. This is the moment that we can change everything. Because of the collective strength that we are demonstrating here today, the days of corporate favoritism are numbered. The idea of divide and conquer politics, dying. And the, the rhetoric of scarcity and the fear of the unknown is starting to mean nothing. State and local governments throughout the U.S. are taking direct steps to protect people on our planet. And we are already kicking out fossil fuel companies. We are already kickstarting new clean energy economies. And the next step is a zero carbon emissions uh, for all of Hawaii and the U.S. And if we can kick out these particular tanks, it will be a huge message. Not only that we stand for our water, that we stand for our aina, that we also don't accept the militarization of our land and our people. These are the kinds of things, this is the opportunity that we can take. To, to really push back on this administration and make Hawaii a better place in the future. Thank you very much. Put your hands together and give a great big round of applause and aloha to my cousin, Kalama. I love you guys. And down the, the mic goes. <laughs> Yeah, I've been told I've been a, I'm a little limb challenged, but I have plenty mana. So I want to share an oli with you to begin to remind us that this is Kanaka Maoli land. And to remind you that there is many gifts that our people can share with you. Alohaina kalamo kaina ke ia palikua na ko lau ka papa moku o hina mai kupuna mai moku o niau mai noho mai ka ava o oahu. I come to you here today as somebody very proud in my Kanaka Maori ancestry. I come to you today also as somebody who is very proud of my Chinese and Korean ancestry. And right now at this moment we have a point in which both are under attack. As Trump goes to Asia, we know he's going to go there and scold everybody around the world and cause even more enemies. So what's happening here is he is going to create at the low, history of the lowest ratings of any president of the United States. What is the one thing that can save a president? War. War. And who are they picking this war against? North Korea. And if you look at, actually look at the capacity of North Korea, can they hit Hawaii? The chances are probably not. And even if they do, they have four possible bombs to all of the thousands and thousands of nuclear bombs that the United States has. Thousands. So I'm here to remind people to not forget for the native peoples of Hawaii and the First Nations of Mokuhono, as well as the Africans who are brought 
as slaves that America has never been great. And we're looking at a time right now, right now is a point that we're always in Hawaii, it's hard to live here. If you look at who he's attacking, what this regime is attacking, they're attacking us. Look at your skin, is it brown, yellow? Is it red, black? This attack is against you. If you are struggling to make a payment and don't know if you're going to have a home next month and you're sacrificing and grinding your skin down to the bones just to survive, this is attack is against you. If you think that you might get ill and might lose insurance, this attack is against you. And here in Hawaii, the primary contradiction, the place where you will see the greatest contradictions happening is in the Kanaka Maoli community. Because not only are we overly represented in the jails, not only are we overly represented in all the worst health statistics, where the greatest attacks are occurring is occurring on stolen land. Seeded lands which are truly seized lands. The reason why Hawaii was overthrown was because of military. This regime is not new. They have created a greatness based upon extraction, exploitation, and destruction of peoples all over the world. And Hawaii is not the only nation that is US occupied. So we ask you, and this is something, I recently went to an organizing event in Oakland where a very, wise woman, a Muslim woman said, we have the heart, we have the spirituality, we also have the moral high ground. But what is happening right now is the right is out organizing us. So we need to get stronger, we need to get better, we need to unite across these divisions that they're artificially creating. We have to confront our fears, we have to confront our internal racism, our internal classism, and our internal differences that make us fearful of joining up together. So what I'm asking everybody here of conscience is when the call comes out, right now, the struggle that is facing our people that is building up. And it may not seem like it's connected to empire, and it may not seem that it's connected to this regime because it, have, it started many years ago, many decades ago. It started with the theft of land. But when the call comes out to support and protect Mauna Kea, which is one of the biggest struggles we are fighting right now. And you know, it's not just about science, it's not just about telescope, because I'm a scientist. Our people were proud scientists. What it is, is it's about land. Land and land control. So when the kahea comes out to you, when you think it's just a Kanaka Maoli issue, think again. Because the internal contradictions of this system manifest in our struggles. So I ask you, every one of you, Kukia Imona! Kukia Imona! Okay, so the bar is kind of high for the next speakers, okay? That's a lot of energy, you gotta try and match that, all right? Um, waiting in the wings after these poets that I'm going to bring up will be uh, Colonel Ann Wright for the mil retired military. But right now, please put your hands together. These next poets that are coming up have represented the state in international spoken word competition. Um, they come to us from Kalihi, they come to us from Makiki, they come to us from Alaska and other points in between. Please put your hands together and give a great big round of applause to Jesse Littman and Destiny Sherion. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, like 
everybody. Aloha. All right. So if every political rally began with a football game, would you stand to prove your patriotism? And if I wouldn't read a poem about football or someone didn't cheer for Travis as he threw a long pass to Liz, would we call him a son of a bitch? If we were obedient, had faith in the myth that football is righteous, would that prove our nation's greatness? Confession, I like football. I like open field tackles, misdirection blocking in the Green Bay Packers. Most of my coaches were psychopathic assholes, but football taught me to be tougher, believe in preparation. When Colin Kaepernick took a knee for the national anthem, I thought three things. One, going to the game should not require a compulsory act of patriotism. Two, if we cheer for the violence on the field, the least we can do is cheer for the safety of its players off of it. And three, the history nerd in me is going to write a poem about this shit. Let's go. We interrupt this rally for a public service history timeout. The Star Spangled Banner was a poem written by a slave owner named Francis Scott Key during the War of 1812. The war was declared by the United States on Britain to protect American shipping company profits. Britain was more interested in fighting France, so they sailed a few commanders across the ocean and told them to find their own soldiers. Their British forces were escaped American slaves, ready to fight, to fight the United States, to liberate their families. Hirings, free men willing to die for the right price or cause, and Native Americans led by the Shawnee Tecumseh, who had unified nations and tribes to fight for a sovereign native state of America, a place where native people, culture, and ways would be honored. Your history textbook says it was between the United States and Britain. Actually, it was America's first and realist civil war. For two years, the field position went back and forth. Redskins blitz U.S. forts in today's football heartland of Michigan, Ohio State, and Notre Dame. Chiefs of the Creek Indians retook parts of Alabama. Ravens and hirelings sacked Washington, burnt the first Congress, and White House and freed the people who built it. U.S. losses in the war liberated more enslaved Americans than any event in history prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. But the white patriots got a comeback win in Baltimore. The war was called the tie. Britain sold out its native allies, and America preserved slavery for two more generations. The Star Spangled Banner is a throwback party anthem of conquest and bondage. We sing the Diplo J. Cole remix in King's original hit. He spits 1814 style battle lyrics. Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge and grave could save the hiring and slave from the terror of flight or gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner doth wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. But if a nation stole freedom's land, raped its woman, burned its home, would freedom stand for their song? Nah, freedom? Freedom is a touchdown dance, a prince trap. Free's mic is always on. Free don't wear a uniform, free styles. Wakes up with the sun, navigates by stars, got a full moon in her heart. Brave stretches out for a fingertip grab on a crossing pattern. Brave don't torture, brave is not a prison. Brave overthrows the plantation. That stars and stripes eats everything on the table and calls you selfish when you ask them to please pass the chicken. If we stand to honor our soldiers, does a hand on your heart honor the blood of their invasions and occupations? Shit, America's greatest win was getting us to fight for their profits in the name of our freedom, to sing a song of the conquests that divide us. So call me a son of a bitch. When I go to the game, it's to cheer for the green and yellow. For the red, white, and blue, I'll take a knee for justice. Mic check, this is hot. Thank you. All right, um, bear with me. We haven't done this one since uh, we went to Denver and represented Hawaii and uh, Nationals, so. This is Destiny Sherryon, by the way. Give it up for Destiny. <laughs> The first 
first year in the presidency of Bernie Sanders. It begins with Bernie showing up to his inauguration in a used Prius. The overflow crowds cheered as Barack Obama gave an eloquent goodbye speech, then said, Peace out, and flew straight to Hawaii to light a legal spliff. The prince rose from the dead to sing the sexiest version of America the Beautiful before Bernie took to the podium and said, <clears throat> Ooh, child, things are gonna get easier. Is replacing the Star Spangled Banner as the national anthem. The next day, ISIS renounced violence, beheaded patriarchy, and brewed a giant batch of kombucha. On day three, seat patterns were outlawed. All school lunches became local, organic. Standardized tests were canceled. And, and replaced by critical thinking challenges. By day four, the word socialist had become a compliment. There's the point. On the next day, Vice President Elizabeth Warren implemented universal, universal health care, equal pay for women, and gave Russia the hand. On February 14th, the entire Congress did a Cupid shuffle flash mob while President Sanders visited the Mexican border and announced the building of a giant cable suspension bridge with zip lines, rock climbing walls, and a thousand miles of solar panels. You know good white people shit. And on the next day, the Democratic Party admitted to decades of pandering to its base while governing for the rich and spontaneously combusted. After that, Republicans transported back to their spaceships and went home to the galaxy of pastiness. And on the 77th seven, 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 seven day, we rested. We visited our friends, our elders, and, and just listened. listened. When we went back to work that Monday, there was an executive order. Putting Native Americans and Hawaiians in charge of border control and, and homeland security. security. And by November 4th, 2017, Donald Trump was spotted selling orange fragments of his tortured soul on the Home Shopping Network. But Bernie isn't our president. And it feels like our prom date dumped us in front of the whole world. And we spent prom at Zippy's, all alone, eating a local moco in a tuxedo. But does it really matter who's president? It won't unsteal native lands. Breathe life into flint bodies hanging from cottonwood trees. Freeze melted glaciers, put truth into brainwashed minds. Feed your family. family. Yeah, Bernie Sanders would have been sweet. But everything isn't going to be all right. Things aren't going to get easier until we come, come together, together as neighbors, as equals, put people, people in front of profits, practice systems, systems of justice, go beyond, resist, resist protest, and, and take control of our present. Because tomorrow the sun will rise fearless in the east. The moon will crescent, expand her arms just beyond our reach, and dare us to dream. And someday, We'll put it together and we'll get it undone. Because that's not the job of any president. That, that is, is the, the work, work of everyone. everyone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm going to the crowd. I'm going to here. So I'm going to... Um, I'll be cutting in and out. It's my phone. Uh, I got a... It's a... Uh, See the ones on top, where they are feeding us lies, and we the people have sacrificed our right to guide the path of our own minds. We let them invest the our thought post. process with their manufactured media garbage that's been fractured, censored, and then presented as if it were pure, to assure the mass populace feels secure and we take it all in, letting them blur our better judgment and mute our intuition. We vote at a federal level with a naive belief that we're making a choice when really we're dancing with the devil to a song with no voice. Deciding amongst our kind what we find to be the less of two evils. But see me, I know that regardless who the front man is, black, white, Mr. or Miss, in reality, someone else is running the show. So no matter which way the polls go, we the people need to assemble and take control. See, spreading the truth could be the difference between a government molded youth and an enlightened group of free thinkers who will refuse to inhale this toxic pollution, who will unite, fight, and ignite a revolution. So we brainstorm solutions. And suddenly, I feel quite grounded, sound in my way of being. I'm finally seeing how to reach my center. As I enter a place laced with grace on a constant chase for creative wordplay, heard they, found my way of thinking profound, see, I live life free and I like to push 
boundaries. And I am always me. I try very hard to be the change I wish to see in the world, and I know I am only one girl. So what are we going to do tonight, brain? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world one poem at a time. I will let my light shine through me. It's true, we are divine beings. The extent of our capabilities have yet to be seen because they are conditioning us to believe this is all we will ever be. And it's a little tricky to see the subliminal, message, the subliminal messaging they feed through TV, scene, TV screens, magazines, and advertising schemes. But you must look deeper, become the seeker of your own truth because they are brainwashing our youth in plain view and it's up to me and you to say what? Raise them with strong will, sharp intellect, and the sense to detect what it means when the hair stands up on the back of your neck. Treat everybody with respect. But don't blindly let anybody tell you what to do. You better question authority if it doesn't seem right to you because the authority should not be the truth. In fact, the truth should be the authority, but our government is run by the interest of few and not what's best for the majority. See, there's a new world order sweeping our nation, keeping us in isolation, seeking world domination. And this is more than a secret society conspiracy theory. Please, open your minds and hear me. Shout out to the poets. Before I bring on the next speaker, just a couple of announcements. In case people didn't know, we do have a food truck out here, The Spot. And The Spot, not only is it awesome food, they're really awesome people who have always supported fights for social justice, been big supporters of Revolution Books. So I encourage people to go support The Spot, and their food is really good also. Um, I also want to let people know, I hope I get the woman's name right, I apologize if I don't, I think it's Ellen, who made these really cool pussy hats. So, I'm going to leave this bag of pussy hats next to the stage, please feel free to come up and get one, and don't feel afraid to remind people, don't grab my pussy like the sexual predator in chief. So I'm really honored to call up the next two speakers. Um, the first person speaking is retired Colonel, um, U.S. Army Colonel Anne Wright. Um, she's, a, like I said, a retired Army Colonel. Um, in 2003, she resigned her uh, state diplomat position in opposition to the Iraq War. And she is just an awesome person always traveling literally around the globe. It's hard to keep track of where she's been, where she's heading to. Um, she's also with Veterans for Peace. So please welcome Anne Wright. Thank well, thank you very much, Liz. It's a pleasure always to come home to Hawaii. Uh, it, we have a wonderful, unique place right here, a place that has such cultural heritage, and yet we are the place that is one of the most militarized islands in the whole world, with four major military bases. And when we talk about uh, resist fascism, uh, and I, I really would encourage everybody to look at these big posters that are up here that really delineate what is happening in our world today. Uh, the wars that are going on, and well, I just want to acknowledge the pussy hatch just disappeared. <laughs> Yeah, get those hats on. I, I was in Detroit, Michigan last weekend for the women's convention, and that was a women's convention that was sponsored by a women's march. How many of you all were a part of women's march here in Honolulu or someplace else in the world? That's right. Well, that that, that happened on uh, uh, January 20th was pretty darn incredible, wasn't it? Pretty darn incredible with millions and millions of women and men and children coming out to challenge challenge an administration that had only been in power one day. And yet we knew what was coming. And true to his word, Donald Trump has embarked on a campaign of what I think is pretty much destruction of our government. I mean, some of it, yeah, probably needed to be changed pretty radically, but what we're seeing now, and what you can read about the destruction of civil liberties, the destruction of the war on immigrants, the war on the incarcerated, are things that have brought you all here today. You are people who understand what's happening, and that you want to take action. You want to take some sort of action that can stop this erosion 
of all of the things that we kind of thought were the better parts of the United States. I mean, we we all recognize we have glitches and blemishes and glitches all through the government, but at some core of it, I think we all could find some little bit of it that we were pretty darn proud of. And many of those aspects of it are now the ones that are under intense, intense pressure from uh, the Trump administration. I worked under eight different presidential administrations, starting with Lyndon Johnson, and then ending when I resigned in 2003 under the Bush administration's war on Iraq. And since then, with Barack Obama and now President Trump, I mean, we've, we've been challenging, um, I'm now part of you all for the last 14 years. Um, before that, I was part of the problem, I guess, being in the, in the government for so long. But now joining with you all over the last 14 years where we have really been challenging so many of the policies of all of these administrations. Uh, one of the great challenges I think we have in the future is uh, how do we get people that we can trust that will come into national office and do the things that they promise to do that are good. I mean, Trump is, is doing what he promised to do, and that's bad. But we need to get somebody that will do what is good for the United States. Uh, this whole issue of wars, the continuous wars that we have, now we're bombing seven different countries, bombing seven different countries, and it seems like every day there's a new article about the U.S. military being in yet one more country and people being killed in that country, the citizens of that country as well as our U.S. military, and the latest being in Niger just this last week. And uh, when we question what is going on, how much... Uh, how much of this militarization of our society are we going to take? The militarization of, uh, of uh, virtually every aspect of our life. Uh, the things that are being done by militaries around the world. And when I do a lot of work on uh, the issue of uh, Palestine and trying to highlight the inequities that are going on for Palestinians uh, that are in the West Bank and in Gaza. And in fact, last year I was a part of yet one more flotilla going to challenge the Israeli illegal, brutal blockade of Gaza. A women's boat to Gaza, as we call it. Thirteen women from thirteen different countries sailing to challenge the Israeli blockade of Gaza, which is only in existence because the U.S. government protects it. So when we look at what Israel is doing and the types of uh, checkpoints that they have against Palestinians in the West Bank and the brutal attacks by drones that they have on the people of Gaza, and we look at what the U.S. is doing in other places and the checkpoints we have on our southern border. In fact, the, this next week is going to be School of the Americas Watch down at Tucson and Nogales, uh, Arizona, where we are now focusing on what the U.S. is doing on that border and the checkpoints that are being used to trap people and then the immigration folks that we have all over our country that are going into health care facilities, that are going into hospitals, that are lurking outside courts to pick up uh, undocumented people and take them immediately to detention facilities which are going by leaps and bounds. The Trump administration saying that they need to have at least 40,000 more beds uh, in facilities because they're going to be picking up so many people, so many people and uh, deporting them. And you read in the newspaper about this young, young woman that had cerebral palsy and they took her out of a care facility, a health care facility, and put her into... That's right, that's right, Michael. Uh, thank you for all of the people that are uh, disadvantaged, that are being a war on them by the Trump administration and a war on all of us by health care, by the destruction of, uh, of health care. So there's so much, so much that we are concerned about and that's why you are here today and I hope that we in Hawaii will continue to raise our voices, raise our voices at the city council level, raise our voices at the state legislature and to thank members of our own state government, for example the Attorney General who was so strong and challenging the Trump administration's ban on Muslims. So it's a pleasure to be back in Honolulu and be in Hawaii and keep up the great work and let's challenge the Trump and Pence administration in every way we can. Thank you.
So Anne Wright always inspires me, and she's such a good example of what someone who is in the government can do when they get out. So shout out to Anne. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Nick, and I, uh, I teach criminology at UH. Um, with the anniversary of the 2016 election coming up, I've been thinking a lot about November 9th, 2016, actually. Uh, that day, you know, I, I teach five classes, and I spend a lot of time with students, and I've never seen my students so upset as on that day. Uh, I think I know why. I think that the, that day they saw their future in a different and much darker light for the first time. And they woke up into a, a nightmare that they didn't, uh, they didn't expect. And the Trump administration definitely is a nightmare. But mass incarceration is another nightmare that we've been living for 30 years. And Trump and Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions are salivating at the thought of deepening that nightmare. Their ideas range from horrifying to almost laughably stupid. I mean, Jeff Sessions lamented recently, why can't we just bring back Just Say No? Uh, but I want to share with you four ways that I think are, are particularly important that they're trying to uh, deepen the, the nightmare of mass incarceration. First of all, they want to end police oversight, accountability, and reform. They're fine with black and brown men and women being murdered and brutalized in the streets by police officers. As fascists, it's only natural for them, to them for police to have unchecked power. And that's why Jeff Sessions froze all federal oversight of police officers shortly after his appointment. Despite the fact that we have two and a half million people behind bars, more than any other society on this planet, they want more people in prison. Trump and Sessions think our brutal criminal justice system should be, more should be tougher and more punitive. Trump signaled this just the other day when he called our system a laughing stock because it didn't deliver violence quickly or severely enough in the wake of terrorist attacks. And I think that we should all acknowledge that if they had their way, they love criminalizing dissent and every single one of us would be in prison if they had their way. They also want to put more immigrants behind bars. We already have nearly half a million immigrants in detention centers. Many of them are women and children who are in there for no other reason than they cross an imaginary line, not only looking for a better life, but also fleeing violence that our government created. These people are suffering under torturous conditions without proper nutrition or health care in facilities that are run by companies like the Corrections Corporation of America. Trump doesn't just want to build a wall to keep people out. He wants walls and bars to keep people in, too. They will also, finally, number four, they want to expand the prison industrial complex. Trump's made it very clear that he, he intends to profit from his public disservice. So why should he have a problem with other forms of uh, profiteering? When he and Sessions ended the moratorium on federal use of for-profit prisons, they doubled down on their commitment to a government run for the profit of corporations. Criminal justice is a major revenue stream for those corporations. So we talk a lot about mass incarceration in the US today, but I think that's kind of a misleading term. It implies that we just have too many people in prison or the wrong people in prison. But that's just a part of a larger problem. That larger problem is that we use prison as a response to all of our social problems and any violence that we witness. We can see that in our own community today as police harass, arrest, and incarcerate homeless people merely for the condition of poverty. This is not simply mass incarceration. It's a prison society. Let's end that nightmare. Let's build a better society. One without men with guns being a constant presence. One where caging human beings is never conf confused with the idea of justice. And one where Cheeto-colored, racist, Sex predators are the ones we call criminal. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nick. I'm going to call up one more speaker. She's on a time constraint, but she's an awesome speaker as well. Um, she's an immigration attorney who's been in the streets speaking out. I've seen her at the protests and the demonstrations against the attacks on immigrants. Please welcome to the stage Claire Hannes. Good afternoon, everyone. Down just a little bit. 
I'm here today to speak on behalf of the thousands of immigrants and members of mixed status families throughout these islands who live in constant fear of real, real fear of imminent deportation. Their voices need to be heard here far more than mine, but they're far too terrified to come forward and speak in public, so I am here. To the policies that keep them living in fear day after day, I am here to say no. I'm here to say no to our immigration detention system that locks up hundreds of thousands of immigrants every year. Right now at the Federal Detention Center, which is located behind the Inner Island, Air, uh, the Inner Island Terminal at the airport, immigrants are locked up because they can't afford to pay or post bond while they're fighting their case before the immigration judge. In the continental U.S., mothers and children stay locked up sometimes for years in family detention centers. And what the Trump administration poses is even worse than that, separating parents from their children as a deterrent to those who are coming to the United States to seek safety. Now, how sick is that? I'm here today to stand up for DACA and the Dreamers, who lives, whose lives are again in a nightmarish state of limbo. Almost 800,000 people came forward to apply for a program that gave them, who as children came to the United States, a protective bubble from deportation fears and the ability to apply for work authorization and live some semblance of a normal life. The current regime was intent on popping that bubble of safety, and it did just that on September 5th. Now those with DACA once again live in fear every day that they'll be ripped from this nation and the families that they love and forced back into places that they don't know. I'm here to say no to the stripping of discretion from those who work for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. While the policies of the Obama administration fell far short of being friendly to immigrants, at least there was some discretion on the table that allowed deportation officers to choose who was on the deportation track. That discretion is now completely taken away. And we've seen just recently in the case that Ann Wright spoke about. The guy is spooky. Powerful. But we must stop him from destroying humanity and destroying Korea. Stand together. Thank you. Just want to let people who are here be aware that there are some folks going around interviewing people. Right now, they're right over there by the banyan tree. Just be very clear. They are not anti-Trump. They are with a group called the Brown, Bra Proud Boys, excuse me, and they stand with Trump in his racist, misogynistic, anti-immigrant, Muslim bashing views. So be aware, when they go around and interview people, they like to use this on YouTube and other social media and, you know, slice it and edit it in certain ways. So, you know, we're all for a lot of people to be yeah, there. Bunch of white have boys. Faith, but be very aware that they have a whole other agenda. And they also go around and are upfront and truthful about which side they stand on. Because you need to stand with humanity. Woo! Stand with the f***ers who are against humanity. Yeah, working. So give it a couple seconds. Let it test out. Time if it freezes. Any good that will be soon done.
Down a little bit, uh, we're in here, from vocal.
We'd like to call up Bogdong to share with us. We're going to back him up real quick on a very important song from Korea. Okay. Hello, greetings. Okay, the song is from Maridong, which is a song both north and south for reunification. Okay, ready? I'll sing a karaoke style, not a bomb style. Aridang Aridang Ario crossing over Aridang Pass. Once you leave me here, my dear, after three miles, your feet will be lame. Korea's one. Alright. Well, as the latest example of a defiling. Uh, what's happening here at, you can you can try to erase history you can take out the Union Jack that once was laid historically here but you can only delete it and you can't erase it and uh, but for the Patriots you know in the Queen the spirit of the Queen calling for honest Americans if there's such a thing as a constitution or it's a Yanko and Baba here we go from back in the 70s uh, and to Clara cool cold lovely time called song called Kickback Jack. Spending my money Well, I've got a sign Give me back my 
you so much to Laulani and Liko. And the band. And the whole and band. And the band, you know. There's the people's, people's band. Okay, I want to thank them for taking the time to come down and play. And a shout out to all the musicians. Big shout out to Oren, who's been busting his butt on the sound. Good job, Oren. And I want to thank people for hanging out to the end. We got five speakers left. They're good speakers, so don't leave and stick around. Uh, I'm going to call up first to the stage, um, Cara. She's an activist with Affirm a transnational feminist organization, so here comes Kara. And some other sisters with her. Hi everyone. I'm here uh, to give the collective statement from Affirm Hawaii. How many of you follow Affirm Hawaii on social media? Yeah, so those of you who don't, I strongly suggest that you do. It's highly educational. We are an unapologetically transnational feminist activist organization. So we met many of you uh, almost exactly a year ago at the very first Trump rally. And that day we declared that it was the year of the rise of global fascism. We were wrong. It's actually the year of the militant woman. And we know that we stand on a lot of history and a lot of struggle. In 1969, the second wave of feminism, the movement that brought us the theory that we stand on today, civil rights for women, abortion, domestic violence as a political issue, violence as pandemic against women, many of those things ignited onto the national stage with a protest against the Miss America pageant. So we were here today to reignite that fire, to protest not just Donald Trump, but also the entire system that he exploited to get into power. We are transnational feminists. If you don't know what that means, it means that we're the creations of imperialism that we've been talking about. We are the creations of global imperialism. So we know that Trump's tour through Asia, his business and national security tour is actually a femici femicidal campaign. When we speak of militarism, we need to remember that the one who is most impacted, who is most violated by imperial armies is a woman. We need to always open the conversation about gender and not take any stance without understanding where women of color are on this issue. There is no movement without women of color. There can be no class solidarity if there is a gender divide between us that stands in the way. There can be no ethno-national solidarity if there is the gender divide between us that stands in the way. So we just want to remind you today to welcome uncomfortable conversations, to remember that the revolution starts in your own home, and to the sisters in the audience to remember the lesson that we just learned from Me Too, which is that courage is contagious. So we hope that you join us. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. Mahalo. All right. Our next speaker comes to us. Is that my mic? All right. Our next speaker is a member of the... Uh, Hawaii State of House of Representatives. He has been a member since 2012. He currently serves as Majority Policy Leader and Chair of the Ocean Marine Resources and Hawaiian Affairs Committee. Please put your hands together for Kaniela Ng. Aloha everybody. I'm looking out in the audience and I'm seeing a lot of young people, people of color, and women. And I just want to say hello future. And I say future because women are attaining degrees of higher education more than men. They're reinventing industry and most importantly they're leading our struggles. If only women voted last election, only seven states would have gone to Donald Trump. Young people. 
if only the change generation, by the way, if only young people under 35 voted last election, only two states would have gone to Donald Trump. Change generation. People of color. If only people of color voted last election, which by the way, America would have caught up with Hawaii by the year 2040 and become a minority majority nation. If only people of color voted last election, zero states would have gone to Donald Trump. So take heart in one another. We have the key to the future here in Hawaii. Diversity is the key to the future. But we have a president who just a few days ago said that diversity may sound like a good thing verbatim now, but it's not a good thing. If that's not a white supremacist dog whistle, I don't know what is. People are waking up to the fact that our voices are being silenced by a handful of wealthy elites like Trump and Pence. So we will stand up and speak out even louder. Audre Lorde says the only thing more frightening than speaking your truth is not speaking at all. So when Trump and Pence comes after DACA or tries to stop the DREAM Act, we will lock arms with our immigrant sisters and brothers. And when Trump and Pence comes after Title IX or try to defund Planned Parenthood men, we will lock arms and follow the lead of the women in our lives. And when Trump and Pence comes after transgendered individuals in the military or the right to marry or incarcerated people or the poor communities, we will lock arms with the most vulnerable among us. If he comes for one of us, if they come for one of us, they will have to take all of us. That's solidarity, and that's how we will win the world we want to see. But we know that no is not enough. We need to bring a positive vision beyond resistance. We've been resisting now for about a year, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting. We're pulling America back from the past when we should be focusing on the future. Here's my story. My, my grandfather was a Japanese-American World War II veteran who fought for his country overseas despite facing discrimination back home. This administration has said that they support the idea of internment camps. In 2017, Waikiki, most of Waikiki may soon be underwater within a generation or two, and this administration pulled out of the climate accord. This is crazy. Most importantly, I have a one-year-old son who I'm afraid to leave the TV on around in fear that his president is going to teach him that it's okay to sexually assault women. This isn't a, a, an issue of, you know, partisanship. Donald Trump is a threat to our values and our future. I'm tired of asking questions of fear, like how do we stop a, a nuclear war from happening? Or how do we keep Russia from controlling our government? Or how do we keep our taxes from being handed out to billionaires? I want to ask questions of hope, like how do we achieve universal health care? How do we achieve equal pay for women? Affordable college for a free college for everyone. How do we decommodify our basic needs? Those are the questions I'm interested in. How do we get big money out of politics? How do we save our planet from climate change and sea level rise? So please join me. I will be the first today, I will be the first elected official in Hawaii to support the impeachment of Donald Trump. And please join me in this movement. No longer shall Trump hog our organizing capacity. Let's focus on building a positive vision of progress beyond resistance. And that's the way we'll win the world we want to see. Thank you so much for speaking your truth. Aloha. And Trump, aloha means goodbye as well. <laughs>
we're going to have two more speakers. We're going to have Hector and Noel Kent are going to be coming up to wrap it up. We got the young guys and then uh, the old guys. <laughs> I remember no. I shouldn't call them old guy. Why not? That's not a bad term. I'm an old guy. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Jung Ha Kim and I am the co-president of the UH Manoa's LGBTQ Plus Association Rainbow Alliance. And this is Alyssa. Hello. Great to meet you all. Thanks for coming. <laughs> So, um, a few years ago, I used to think that politics was something entirely unnecessary, that those in power were there to protect us, ensure our future success, and represent our best interests. I mean, obviously I was very wrong, and it took me a while, but after 16 years of living, it finally hit me that um, the personal is a political, and that everything that has to do with politics and the personal life does matter. I am a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I am Korean and I am an immigrant. And never before in my life have I been so afraid for the safety of my friends and family. As a queer person, I am afraid that we will be erased. LGBTQ plus content has been removed from the White House and National State Department's website, effectively removing us from the public eye. And this happened a day after Trump was sworn into office. Those who prioritize corporations over people deny cold hard facts like climate change and consider the rights of marginalized groups to be unimportant were nominated and placed into positions of power. I mean, just recently, his administration even went as far as voting no on the UN resolution that would condemn the death penalty against those in consensual sex same-sex relations. To Trump, we are not people worthy of the same protections and rights that others get to experience. As an as an immigrant, I am always afraid that families will be split apart, that dreamers will be thrust into a foreign land, and that those who are able to say continue to be demonized. I mean, this administration is ridiculous, right? It views diversity as something unnecessary. And as a Korean, I am also afraid for my family and friends who reside in my homeland, afraid that my loved ones will be caught in the crossfire of a war that 80% of South Korea disagrees with. Like, none of us want it. And even before he started to occupy the Oval Office, he demonized immigrants, invalidated the identities of LGBTQ plus individuals, and poked fun at the increasing political strain in the Korean Peninsula. By doing this, he reminded the world that our lives are just collateral damage when it comes to furthering his agenda. And although I am afraid, I refuse to stand down. Ah. We must continue to fight this regime that does not care about immigrants, the LGBTQ plus community, or the lives of those who exist outside of their bubble. This regime does not represent the United States in its best interests. This regime attempts to divide those who oppose them by attempting to erase us from the public eye, but we continue to fight them we continue to fight a regime that does not respect our existence and has no care for us, right? As marginalized groups and communities, we must stand together in solidarity and refuse fascism. Ah, I wrote this in 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Hello. That's up. I just wanted to uh, thank Josh again for coming here and saying something. He's a really busy guy and he didn't have to be here, but he showed up and good job, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> and I also want to say a thank you to everyone who came out here and that it was super cool marching with everybody and standing with everybody uh, on these very important issues. And I think everybody feels the same, but I know that I am definitely going to keep fighting um, against this regime, regime against uh, all these terrible issues, even if I'm the last one. So just thanks again. Okay, so we got two good speakers left. 
Next, I'm going to call up Noel Kent. He's a professor of ethnic studies, longtime activist who joined the Charlottesville March to Washington, D.C. Welcome, Noel Kent. Hello. Aloha, Kako. Kako. Back on uh, August 12th, some of you may remember that something very disturbing happened. A group of Nazis and KKK members paraded through Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, with torches lit like uh, back in the Nazi era in Germany. And one lovely sweet woman uh, named Heather was actually mowed down by a car, actually murdered. Uh, during the course of the uh, altercations between protesters and the Nazis. And some of us, and I'm sure many of you, were very disturbed by this, to see this, uh, this, 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 these Nazis uh, parading uh, so gleefully through the streets with impunity. And some of us were looking for a response. Where is the blowback? Where is the response? How do people respond to this? And then I happened to see this little this article which mentioned that uh, a number of uh, people had started out from Charlottesville and were doing a 118-mile march to Washington, D.C. Uh, to confront a march to confront white supremacy. And I thought this was really marvelous. This was the kind of response that I was sort of expecting to happen. So a couple of days later, uh, I was uh, at a, a place called Warrington, Virginia, where, you know, I didn't even know existed. And I boarded a little bus and we went to a place where the march was starting for its uh, sixth day. And for the next four days, I walked the highways of Virginia highways that were named after Robert E. Lee, who you may remember was the commander of the Confederate, uh, that's the slaveocracy forces, the forces trying to maintain slavery in the United States in the 1860s, and also named after a man named Robert Byrd, who I remember in the 1960s was an arch segregationist uh, Virginia senator too. So those are the sort of names which uh, could use some changing, I think, at this point. So we, we walked for four days, and we stopped at night in churches, and we were received marvelously by these uh, people of faith. And this made me think, it, it really opened my eyes even more to the idea that we have to form more alliances with people of faith, that there are many, many people in churches, synagogues, temples throughout the United States that can be very strong and powerful moral allies in our struggle for a more just and peaceful America. The march was joyous. I mean, uh, there was a diversity of people who were black, white, Hispanic, Asian. Uh, we just marched along talking to each other. Uh, sometimes it was very warm, sometimes it rained, but we just kept marching and marching. We had our own marshals. The Virginia State Police protected us very well because I think they were a little bit askance at the blowback after Charlottesville and all the violence in Charlottesville, so they wanted to make sure that uh, nothing happened. So the state police were there. Uh, there were some threats, uh, but they never materialized. Most of the people we encountered, the motorists and other people along the way, were tremendously supportive. And that's the other lesson I got from this, that there is a huge amount of support for people like us and the views that we have out in America. There was lots of support for us. And then at the end of the fourth day we marched into Washington DC and we had a huge rally at the Martin Luther King Monument in Washington. We marched right across the Ski Keystone Bridge from Virginia right into the district and marched through the district chanting and we wound up at the uh, MLK monument and that was it was a wonderful conclusion one final thing that happened that really moved me emotionally really really touched my heart deeply was we were up on this uh, crest of a hill just taking a break from from our walking 
And uh, this man approached us, and he had been uh, informed of our whereabouts by one of the marshals, whose uh, name was Muhammad. And he was an imam. He was the he was the religious leader of the mosque in Manassas, in, Man in Manassas, Virginia. And he was this slightly built, very humble, very sweet and kind man. And he started talking. He asked if he could talk to us. And he said, he said these wonderful things. He talked about the humanity and the brotherhood and sisterhood of all human beings. He talked about the compassion that we need for each other. He talked about new ways of building the world. And, and I was deeply moved. And we all were deeply moved. And the only thing I regretted was that a hundred million Americans weren't here, weren't there, to hear the other side, the other face of Islam, the face that we are never shown. Mahalo. Thanks, Noel. And Heather Heyer is a true hero who stood for justice. Okay, I'm going to call up the last speaker. And after um, Hector comes up to talk, I just want to open up the mic for, I know some people have some announcements about upcoming events that are happening, and it's more important for us to stay connected and to know what different organizations are doing so we can all support one another and fight against this shit. So the last speaker, speaker is Hector Valenzuela, also my friend. He's a professor at UH, sustainability activist, also with Hawaii Seed, and he's an activist with World Can't Wait and Refuse Fascism. All right, Hector. Mahalo, Liz. I would like to share my respect to Thomas Square, to the, the Occupy movement, who occupied, who had the longest occupation in the country, uh, here in uh, Thomas Square. <laughs> to the food trucks that fed us today, and to all of you for uh, this awesome day of resistance. Today is the time to act. Today, the world looks at Trump and says, now we can see what the US really stands for. The ugliest form of predatory capitalism, along with a fundamentalist, religious, patriarch patriarchal system of male white supremacy. The world can say, this is what the US is really all about. However, I feel that it is important not to personalize the issues, to not fo focus on the puppets, but rather on the overall structural framework of a political system that over the past four decades, since the days of Ronald Reagan, has followed a steady trajectory to dismantle all major social institutions designed to protect education, health, labor, gender and racial equality, and the environment. The difference now is that Trump is simply spelling it out, full throttle and without window screens. 20 years ago, in nine, 25 years ago, in 1992, the world came together at the Rio Earth Summit, including delegates from Hawaii. Concerted plans were developed to deal with issues of environmental degradation, climate change, and agriculture. From the Rio Earth Summit, we got the Kyoto Protocol as a global roadmap to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. At the Earth Summit, there was also a call to move away from industrial agriculture methods of farming and to move towards a system of sustainable agriculture that would protect the health of farm workers consumers, and the environment. Today, 
as the U.S. dragged, it, dragged its feet, questioned the science of climate change, and brushed aside the Kyoto Protocol, clim climate change has been a harsh reality for at least the past 10 or 15 years. In response, taking the matter in their own hands, today, small rural and indigenous communities all over the world have started to make their own long-term plans to help them deal with the upcoming impacts of climate change. La Via Campesina, the Peasant Way, which is the largest international peasant organization in the world, has clearly described ag agroecology or agricultural ecology as the pathway to develop resilient, sustainable, and self-sufficient rural communities that can best withstand the impact of climate change. Agroecology, at its core, has a strong social component, which consists of basic human rights, gender and racial equality, indigenous rights, food justice, and food sovereignty. It is imperative for us in Hawaii that as we develop farming models to mitigate the impacts of climate change, that issues of social and environmental justice are not relegated or subjugated to the back seat or buried under for the sake of expediency or for fear of appearing to be too radical within the halls of the university or to the power or to the power brokers in Bishop Street. That is, we should not compromise and keep it hush hush when it comes to social justice. Aloha Aina and in solidarity for a free Hawaii. Aloha Aina and in solidarity for a free Hawaii. I should add here the role of the academy or the university. It is important that university professors stepped up to the plate and off the ivory tower to address issues of social justice and environmental justice. For too long, professors with a plantation mentality of subservience with a fear of speaking out have failed to delve in areas of research that can help local communities and instead have supported the status quo and focused their, career, their careers to further their personal professional achievements. In the field of climate change, it has in fact been refreshing to see many eminent professors at the national level to break the mold by speaking out to challenge government or government propaganda. However, as we challenge the Trump and Pence regime, we do need to step back and do some serious introspection to ask ourselves, what kind of social and economic system can put profits above human well-being? What kind of system would take two-thirds of the world resources for itself militarize our communities, arm the world to its teeth, and then contaminate the environment, land our, and our food supply with toxic chemicals, while leaving the most vulnerable segments of the society to fend for themselves. We need to look at the intrinsic nature of our capitalist system to revisit who we are as a people and as a nation. Otherwise, we will just be fiddling around with the issues without really addressing the fundamental or root causes that have taken the human species literally to the brink of a precipice. A different and a better world is definitely possible. Mahalo. formal program I just want to say uh, I just want to say that this last month activists have been out on the street every single day in one place or another going to flyer people from Haleiwa to Wahiawa to Kaneohe to Kailua and we've been talking to literally tens of thousands of people and I want to say very strongly that the support is there. We are what those people are waiting for. That everywhere I've gone, the majority 
are saying, why aren't people standing up? Where are the people? We need to get this guy out. He's going to kill us all. Let's get, we have to bring those people, bring them in, talk more, build the movement, talk with people in your churches, in your classrooms, in your families, wherever you are. Bring them together. And it, let's get over this manini shit that's going on between movements, between people of, oh, I don't like this person, or I don't like that group. Look, there's a fascist regime. The fascist regime is trying to, to silence all of us. They're trying to silence every group. And I want to challenge everyone here. If you see anyone under attack, for standing up against the regime. Stand with them. Even if you disagree with a lot of their issues, even if you may not like them personally, stand together and protect them because this regime is out to get everyone who is challenging them. And it's up to us. You know, when I was a small kid, I always asked, where, what, where were those Germans? I asked, what would I do? I've asked that now for my whole life and now find myself in this situation. We have to do what the German people didn't realize soon enough that they have to do. We can do it. We can do it together. We can do it in our thousands. We can do it in our millions. So bring people out. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we're going to have a little sign holding here. It is the day that uh, Trump got elected. On uh, next Saturday, please be at the war memorial at Fort DeRussi and say no more war, no more nukes, no more fucking America first. We're part of humanity. We're part of the world. Join us. We aren't able to go out every single day like they are in San Francisco and L.A. We don't have the forces now, but we have to bring those forces together. So it's up to you. Talk to everyone you know. If you aren't on the Refuse Fascism email list, make sure you are. Connect. Our next group meeting is going to be uh, not tomorrow, but the following Sunday at 3 o'clock at the Saunders Courtyard at UH. Come and join us become part of the team, start holding signs over the freeway with us. It's fun, it's legal. Go out into the neighborhoods. Let's get together and move this. Move it to where we have all of our people together and all of the divisions are going away and people finally can say, the reason I like this movement is because they can all work together. Thank you very much.
Hi, I'm Liz Reese. Hi, I'm Liz Reese. Hi, I'm Liz Reese. Hi, I'm Liz Reese. And welcome to Voices of Resistance. Today's show, I have one of my most favorite guests and someone whom I admire very, very much. Anne Wright. Anne Wright. Anne Wright. Anne Wright. Anne Wright. Anne Wright. Always good to have you. Thank you very much for being here once again. I know you have a very busy schedule. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Voices. Voices. Voices, 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 voices of resistance. A war for order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls. A war on terror, a war on drugs, a war on kindness, a war on hugs. A war on birds and a war on bees, they got a war on hippies trying to save the trees. A war with jets and a war with missiles, a war with high-seated government officials. Wall Street war on high finance, a war on people who just love to dance. A war on music, a war on speech, a war on teachers and the things they teach. A war for the last 500 years, a war's just messing up the atmosphere. A war on Muslims, a war on a war on Jews, a war on Christians and Hindus, a whole lot of people saying kill them all, they got a war on Mumia, Abu Jamal, the war on pop is a war that's fair, a war that's filling up the nation's jails, World War 1, 2, 3, and 4, chemical weapons, biological war, Bush War 1 and Bush War 2, they got a war for me, they got a war for you, can't stop when the beat just drops,